All right, it's our passage. But the Holy Spirit produces this kind of fruit in our lives. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness. Everybody shout goodness. Faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. There is no law against these things. Amen. Please be seated. We're going to get to goodness today. But I want to start, because while I was away, as I always do, I listened to the preaching here, the teaching here. My brother-in-law did a wonderful job. And yeah, celebrate that. Did a wonderful job. I want to start kind of where you left off at. And if you're here last week, and if you missed last week, go look at this on on our website. Just check it out. It's on our website. He actually started at verse 18 where Paul is making the comparison between what's called the works of the flesh. He has this long list of stuff running from sexual immorality to uh, temple, uh, 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 an outburst of outrageous temper that is just destructive, etc., And he makes the point that if these characteristics are the ultimate defining points of your life, that you actually could miss God's kingdom eternally. The point that Paul was making is that the work of the Holy Spirit in your life is really about life and death, eternal and time. Robert made that point, which was what Paul made. I thought it was a great point. The second point he made was that the work of the Holy Spirit, when we talk about fruit, shout fruit. That's the character of God, that it is not about behavior modification. I'm so happy he made that. So he suggested that, you know, you can't just go, you just modify your behavior. And this is what Paul is arguing in the larger text. If you read the whole chapter, you see he's making this argument that at the end of the day, it's not about you changing you. Come on now. It is about God transforming you. And then Robert said this. He said, he said so, so how do you do it? Watch this. And he says, well, you got you to gotta long to want to get closer and closer to God. I, I agree with that. But the question is, how? Everybody shout how. Now, if you come here fairly regularly, you know I, I teach on this point from time to time that I think every follower of Jesus who's serious about faith, you ought to have a five, ten minute devotional time some point during your day. I would argue early in the morning. You pull out your scripture, you read a little scripture, you can get a devotion, you can go to the store and buy a devotion, get it online, scripture and reflection. Spend a little time talking to God, that's what prayer is, thanking him for what he's done, laying out what your needs are, asking for direction. Five, ten minutes, just, you see, the more time you spend with God, the closer you get. You show up here at church and you don't just sing about God, but you sing to God. Come on now. Come on, you don't just wait for a message to entertain you. You're listening for how God can take broken flesh like me or Robert or somebody else and speak to you. And you're listening for what can I leave here to go do? Everybody shout do. That's how the word becomes flesh in you. You go do it. Not perfectly, but faithfully. But there's one more area where the Holy Spirit, in terms of his work in your life and your being transformed, where it actually explodes, I would say, exponentially. Let me back into it. Let me show it this way. A few weeks ago, I pointed out a tree. I brought this tree back because I think it's really a great idea. This is a, we took this picture. This is a, this is, this is a trap. This tree, y'all, y'all see it? It's growing up through a rock. And it reflects, I believe, what God's Holy Spirit wants to do in all of our lives. In some way, all of our lives is kind of like a rock. It's solidified with our own philosophies and our own various thoughts. And God's Spirit, as he comes into us, wants to, wants to make his way up through, our, up through our lives, through the rock of our lives. And Tim Keller says that there's three things about it that you need to remember. That, that Christian change, and we're looking at this as an example, Christian change. That Christian change is internal. Shout internal. Uh, secondly, put the tree back up there. It's, uh, it's, it's also gradual. Shout gradual. This didn't happen overnight. Didn't happen in a year. Took time. But he also says it's inevitable. Shout inevitable. The rock couldn't stop it. 
It's inevitable. And those of us who have surrendered our lives to God as we were singing, none of us do it perfectly, but we seek to do it faithfully. God's spirit working in your life is inevitable. There's one more thing. One more thing. Tell the person next to you, listen up, listen up. If you've been here a while, you know some of this story. I was in the 10th grade. I had a horrendous reputation of being a class clown and an everyday fool. We got some kids here, so listen up, kids. My reputation outran me. I went to Ms. Gafford's World History class, and she threatened my life. You come in here acting a fool, I'll kill you. That's what she told me. Thank God for teachers who threaten students' lives. (laughs) Then she asked a question. And I raised my hand not to answer the question correctly. I raised my hand to say something funny, to make everybody laugh. And she called on this and this and this and this. And she finally called on me. And when she called on me, out of my mouth came the right answer. It was a miracle. It's, it, it's kind of like preaching up here, right? <laughs> everybody was shocked, especially me. This gaffer said this. In retrospect, it was the voice of God. She said this, Sister Boy, if you would stop acting a fool and go home and study, you could be somebody. Listen up, kids. Watch this. Here's the point I'm trying to make. This part you don't know if you've been around. So I went home. Something shifted in me. I, I, I think something happened in that moment that that made me, uh, you know, I was literally failing and flunking out of school, literally. It it would have been a matter of semesters and I'd been a dropout. But I wanted more. I was uh, was scarred and, and I had shame that was connected to my scars. But I wanted more. My grand aunt and uncle who raised me, they were going to be devastated. They poured the second half of their lives in their 60s and 70s, the best years of the second half of their lives into me. When I was, when I flung out of school, they were going to just be devastated. I didn't want that. There was something in that moment that caused me to open that world history book, and I started to make my way through the page, crying because every, every other paragraph had to look up a word and crying because the concepts seemed to be so challenging. But I, I, I wanted more and, and, and out of my soul came to cry, God, I, I can't do this. Help me. And now, Here's the secret to how the Holy Spirit explodes in your life. Yes, his work is internal. Yes, it's gradual. Yes, it's inevitable. But it also is, listen, a breaking. I broke. Go back to the tree. Watch it. Go back to the tree. Look, it's internal. It's gradual. It's inevitable. But it also happens in a breaking. And when you look at this, you ask the question, well, what broke the rock? Was it the tree pushing up through the rock? And I suspect there was some moments and times when, in fact, that led to some of the breaking. But also, if a scientist was here, he said it wasn't just a tree. That over years, perhaps decades, the earth shifted beneath the rock in ways that, sh- that shifted its weight back and forth. Uh, uh, and they would probably say that gravity had a lot to do with it. So sometimes, come on now, the breaking happens just 
in life. Come on now, that you're going to show up in a brokenness and, and it's your fault because you just made some stupid decisions. Right? We all do. And sometimes the brokenness is going to happen in your life because it has nothing to do with what you decided. It has to do with somebody dogging you out, breaking your heart. Sometimes the breaking comes because there's a death to somebody that you love and leaves you fully without explanation. Uh, and sometimes it's God working in you the way that he had been working in me, not just after that class. Come on now. He had been working, growing in me for some time. And it was that intersection that he was able to. Okay, what am I saying? God does his best work when you find yourself broken by life. Now, some of you just don't know. You've, you showed up there. You didn't know. You didn't hear this message. And so you're in the midst of brokenness of life. I mean, you know, you didn't know that the way God transforms your character as you struggle in the midst of the brokenness of life, it's the same way a, a, a butterfly develops in the midst of a cocoon. That in the brokenness of life, come on now, uh, you have to, basically you're making a confession. Here's the three elements of the confession. It's what I said, it's what you may use different words, but it basically is this. It's number one, God, I can't do this. Number two, I desperately need your help. And number three, would you help me to try? Say, help me to try. And it's in that moment, like a butterfly, come on now, trying to break against the cocoon. You are pushing against the struggle in your life. And it is the Holy Spirit, like in the, in the butterfly gets strong because the fluid, as he pushes, come on, come on, works his way through the wing. And when the wings get strong enough, they push through the cocoon. Come on. And, and that's how the Holy Spirit, he's literally working through our lives as we push against the struggle. Shout subtlety. Here's the subtle decision, though. In your broken season, you have to decide to surrender to God. Now, some of you, you made a different decision. Here's why. You thought that in your broken season, divorce, in your broken season, maybe uh, your family uh, and domestic violence and, 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 and it just created such trauma. In your broken season, bankruptcy, in your broken season, you concluded that God had abandoned you. That was a lie. He was right in there with you. Saying, choose Everybody shout, wow. All right, let me back it up to Scripture. One of my two favorite passages, you've been around, I quote them all the time. Philippians 4, 13. Here's what Paul writes. Same guy writes to Galatians. Here's what he writes. I can do all of this. Shout all of this. King James Version says, I can do all things through him, Jesus Christ, he's referring to, who gives me what? All right, great verse, but where does it come from? Back up one more verse behind. Why go? Here's what he's saying. I know how to live on almost what? All with everything. I have learned the secret of living in every situation, whether it is with a full stomach or with plenty or... Come on now. And so what Paul is talking about, his life has been full of ups and struggles and has been in the brokenness, right? Living in the little, living in the empty. Come on now. Living in the nothing. It is in those moments that he said, I'm going to trust God anyway. Come on now. Uh, total praise. That's what they were thinking. Come on now. I'm going to trust him. And, and that's where the Holy Spirit formulated his Like the tree in the rock, not overnight, but over time. And it's painful, guys. You know, it's painful. Did I not tell you that when I decided to lean into God, 
I told you I cried through my studies, but I returned the next day, cried through my studies, but I returned the next day determined. And, 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 and what I'm trying to get you to see is that at the end of the day, come on now, uh, uh, you can do all things, not through a self-help book, but through the power of God's Holy Spirit working in your life. And yes, he can use the tools that you might learn in a book, but at the end of the day, it will be the Holy Spirit character. All right, let's go back and watch what Paul writes in Romans 8. Another one of my favorite verses, Romans 8, 37. Here's what he writes. Just watch it. Watch what there's an end point here. The point is, no, Paul writes, in all these things, we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. I, I, I can emerge a conqueror, right, through the one who loved me because the Holy Spirit, if I choose God, aligns his work with the love of God in my life. But where does this come from? Back up two verses just before this to see the struggle. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Come on. He's really giving his own testimony and encouraging the Christians in Rome. Rome's who's going through struggle, shall trouble, a hardship, a persecution, a famine, a nakedness, a danger, a sword, a violence. That's what that word means. Shall any of that separate us? And Paul says, no. As it is written, for your sake shall we face death all day long. But I've learned in my greatest broken life moments, I call it transformative brokenness. I lean towards God. And his spirit works love, joy, peace. to spill out and goodness well I cried I studied I cried I studied listen students I cried I studied but by the end of the semester come on now God's supernatural power got loose amidst my natural ability come on now and by the time it was over at the end of the semester I went from the bottom about the front out of school to the top five in the class that's what God can do God is saying to somebody right now you're about to flunk out of life you're about to quit you're at a point you've gotten half of it right I can't do this but now he says, you got to get the other two parts. Cry out, I desperately need you, God. And then say, help me to try. And you will cry and live. Cry and live. Cry and live. And you're going to wake up one day. Not flunking out of life, but in the top of God's class. Not because of what you accomplished, but what the Holy God has done in you. Now, this transformative uh, brokenness comes in two forms. One form it comes in is through great pain. I just gave you the example of great pain. The other form it comes in is through uh, uh, great gratitude. Quick story. Um, um, The other day, first of all, everybody who gives in this church even if it's 25 cent, 50 cent, we've gotten focused. If it's your first time giving, if it's kids, adults, every one of you get a letter from me thanking you for taking a step of faithfulness. The other day, we had somebody who gave a large gift. And so I picked up the phone and called them. It's an unusual gift, and I wanted to call them, hear my voice saying, 
I wanted him to hear my voice saying thank you. She got on the phone. She was shocked. It was me. And after she got over the shock, I told her why I was calling. She said, well, Pastor, let me just tell you. She said, this wasn't easy for me. She said, uh, uh, now, if it was my husband, he'll give the house away. She said, not me. I don't part with stuff too quick, and especially not money. She said, but we were in debt, and we've been praying and praying and praying. God, help us. Show us what we need to do. Give us some grace. And she said, out of the blue, a relative sent a check, big check, and wiped out most of the debt. And she said they were so full of gratitude that in a real sense, she led the effort saying, let's pray and ask God, how do we respond? Come on now. And she said, God confirmed. And so she took this huge step, and she wrote this big check. Come on now, in secret, not trying to, not expect expecting a call from the pastor. She just was trying, come on now, to be faithful to God who had been faithful to her. And she didn't realize that there was some cracking, come on now, some breaking. And the Holy Ghost was working goodness. In her life. He was working love. And God generated joy. God generated peace, patience, kindness. His spirit was coming more and more alive in her. So, transformative brokenness comes through great pain, but it also comes through Great gratitude. Now I've backed into where we're going to end. Let me say a word about biblical goodness. Tell the person next to you, I thought he had forgotten. I wasn't sure. I was just waiting. <laughs> Actually, I've been talking about it all along. I've been inside of it. All right, let me give you, here's the definition for biblical goodness. It's rare. It's unusual. It's not. That's uncommon. It, 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 watch this. When the Holy Spirit tends, transforms you through the brokenness of life, either by pain or gratitude, usually you are so aware of what God has forgiven you for, what God has delivered you through, how God has been overwhelmingly grace-filled to you, that, that, that usually that awareness, watch this, causes you to be other people sensitive. Say other people sensitive. Come on now. And that is where you begin to see the Spirit of God work. Come on now. You can be loving in unloving circumstances, joy-filled in, 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 in depressing moments. You can, you can come from a place of Peace, when there's chaos around you, you can, it's not just about waiting, but you, it's how you wait. Come on now. Well, with a sense of hope and, and it's the ability to be kind. And at the end of the day, goodness flows out of you, but it's other people's sensitive. Because you recognize in other people their broken life moment. Tell the person next to you, you're in process. All right, find somebody else and say, I'm in process. Good God Almighty, will you realize that God's grace is working in your process? Come on now. You can be an instrument of God's grace working in other people's process. If that makes sense to you, just get a person next to you a high five. Just give them a high five. Does that make sense? <laughs> makes sense. <laughs> Somebody missed in the high five. <laughs> Stay with it. <laughs> All right. So here's the def biblical definition of goodness. It's an action towards others that has the following characteristics. Always generous, sacrifice, Courage and God honoring. 
God honoring means that whatever it is that you're being courageous about, generous towards, and sacrificed towards, it, it, it reflects the values of God. It reflects the heart of God. That in fact, if God was on, on the planet and he is living through you, that God would do the same thing. It's God honoring. So do you see, I've been talking about it. This, this woman, that gift she made, fit all those characteristics. Best place we see it is in God. The Bible says, taste and see, God is good. Amen. And all the time. Oh, I love it. I love it, y'all, to Bob. John 3, 16, 17. Here's God's. Now look for these characteristics. Here it is. John 3, 16. Here it is. It says this. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son, that whosoever believe in him shall not perish, but have eternal life. Watch this. Well, is it generous? He so loved the world that he what? Gave. Where is it? Go back to the other verse. Go back. I'm not there yet. 16. 16. So love the word that he what? Generous. Is it sacrificial? Yes. His one and only son. Is it courageous? Yes. Because he knows that after he gives his one and only son, and after his one and only son gives his life, there is no guarantee that you will accept the gift. Oh, it's a courageous act. Oh, God. And is it God honoring? Absolutely. Now put the next verse up there. Watch this. Watch this. For God did not send his son into the world. So all of you who are afraid of coming to church because you feel like we're going we to condemn you. Come on. I want you to remember this. Now we might convict you. But we're not trying to condemn you, right? Because we acting like Jesus. Come on, for God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but to save the world through him. <laughs> Shout goodness. goodness. Because we have seen goodness in God, we can recognize it in ourselves when it starts to leak out. And we can recognize it in the world around us. By the way, God's goodness, his work of goodness is a part of his character. And how many of you know that God's work of goodness is not just limited to Christians? Thank God. (laughs) But it ought to be uniquely expressed in a Jesus follow because we have the fruit, the character of that God working in us. But we can recognize it. We can recognize it. Oh, let me put 1 John 3.16 here. Here's, here. Here's how 1 John helps us. Here's what he says. Look, he says, he says, this is how we know what love is. Another wonderful word for goodness. It's all wrapped up together. Jesus Christ laid down his life for us. And so we can recognize goodness when we see it. Why? Because we ought to be in our own way laying down, sacrificing, uh, courageously sacrificing, generously sacrificing with great courage in a God-honoring way down our lives for our brothers and our sisters. So I applaud the forces of righteousness and rightness who would dare risk their life in Charlottesville standing up against hate. Because God's goodness always stands against Say, wow. All right, let me prove it. Since I see it in God, I can recognize it in the world. All right, let me give you some examples. It's not just limited to Christians. God's goodness is at work all over the place. All right, come on, let's put some people. Uh, Malala, put a put picture up there. There she is. Here's a woman who fought against the Taliban. And for her fight, they shot her in the head, thinking they had killed her. But God's goodness raised her up, and now she's a symbol for liberation. Come on now, throughout all of the area where Taliban has run. Come on now. Uh, 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 watch this guy, Mohammed Bazi. Put it up there. Mohammed, New York Times, wrote an article on him recently. He and his wife, 
felt moved to open their homes. Look, listen for generous, for sacrifice, for courage, God honoring. To take in children who didn't have homes. And they spent their own resources and others got support doing it. Then they felt God saying, I want you to do something different. More. Shout more. It's the nudging of God's spirit, you see. The nudging. And he said, he and his wife decided that they were going to start taking in children who were terminally ill. And that's what they started to do. That's the picture in his hands of a young lady who's dying, who's terminally ill. In 2000, his wife died, but he has continued to do this work. You see, since we know, we see it in God and Jesus, we can see it, we can recognize it in the world. Here's what he writes, here's what he says. He says, the key of looking after a six-year-old bedridden girl who requires around-the-clock care, the key is you have to love them like your own. That's what he told the Times. He says, I know they're sick, and I know they're going to die. I do my best as a human being and leave the rest to God. Yeah. Shout goodness. Oh, my gosh. And then my, my, my favorite, my favorite, and by the way, we've got examples. I've got a woman right here, part of this church, who has two homes in, in, the, in Redwood City, and she has opened and made her homes available to people between the ages of 60 and 103 years old. And, 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 and they are dealing with various forms of, 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 uh, of, uh, of senility. And, 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 and some of them are terminal. And some of them are just totally disabled. And her and her son and her daughter-in-law, it's a family affair. Come on now. And after her husband died, come on now. See, the, in, in the brokenness of life, God opened up her heart. And she opened up her house. And she's making a difference. Can you say goodness? That is the same Holy Spirit that is at work, that is living in you, usually exposes God's self when you find yourself struggling in broken life. My last example, but my favorite, Helen Keller, born in 1880, June, 18 months of age, she broke, came down with a horrible childhood disease that left her double disabled, blind and deaf. Her parents didn't know how to handle it. Ultimately, through God's grace, she ended up in a school. And later, she was the first person of that level of disability to graduate from college. And she spent her life advocating for social equality and fought against World War II. She spent her life raising untold numbers of dollars for the blind and for the deaf and, and transforming the landscape for them. Uh, 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 she spent her life as an author and a writer, uh, uh, inspiring people. And, and, and here's one of the things that she wrote. Here's one of the things she wrote. Listen, listen. Here's what she wrote. And she was so amazing that she won the, the Presidential Medal for Freedom in 1964. Here's what she wrote. Listen, watch this. Finding God in the dark, broken places of life. You think he's not there, he is. Here's what she wrote about her blindness, her deafness, her experience. She says, once I knew the depth where no hope was and darkness lay on the face of all things, then shall love came and set my soul. She caught a glimpse of Jesus and his purpose and power for her life in the darkness and set her creative soul free. And she says, once I knew only darkness and stillness. Now, shall now, I know hope and can you see the fruits of the Spirit here? Can you see love? Can you see joy? Can you see patience where she started off in the depths 
of hopeless darkness that was then and she had to wait until till God showed up. Come on now. And an open disposition in her brokenness. Patience, come on now. Uh, 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 can, 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 can you see kindness as it spills out? Now I know hope and joy and she lives out of it, fighting and liberating and helping other people and changing the world. Can't you see goodness? I know what you're thinking. You're saying, Pastor, you've lift the bar too high. That's a ladder I don't think I can climb. I'm not asking you to start. God is not asking you to start the top of the ladder. First of all, God is really speaking. First of all, to those of you in the midst of a struggle in your life, you're dealing with sickness, you're, you're dealing with aging, you're, you're dealing with joblessness, you're, you're dealing with t- tragedy on your job or in your house, and, and you're in the middle of a struggle, and, and you don't know what to do. He's saying, I want you to choose me. Right, that's what Helen did. God, I can't do it without you. Help me try. And then he says, I will then show you. We have something called the Peel Challenge. If you haven't signed up for it, you ought to sign up for it before the end of the day. Because we we take you through these exercises, help you to sense the voice leading of God's spirit. Here's what he said. I'll show you how to be good. I'll show you how to let my goodness flow. I'll I'll give you some nudging. Here's what we we, uh, sent out on Tuesday last week. Perfect example for how goodness starts at the bottom of the ladder. You know, I don't have to be Helen, Malawa. Let the God in you help you to be a better you. Here's how it starts. We wrote this. Here's the exercise. We say, take an extra effort today to make eye contact with people. Be ready to help someone in need. Listen, listen. Even someone who may be difficult Say difficult. Come on, you have to say it difficultly. Say difficult. Might be talking about your spouse, your child. Could be talking about you. Come on. (laughs) Don't tell nobody. Then we give you some examples how to do it. Carry their groceries. Hold open the elevator door. Give up your seat. The point being, if you're open... God will show you, first step, how to let his goodness flow out. And he'll transform you and in little pieces, the world around you. Amen.